Okay, we are live. Welcome, welcome. Um, let's go back to screen share. And um, I do, you know, we, I do want, like to take the time to go through introductions because it's so nice for us to, you know, hear about the many different ways our volunteers support our work. It's nice to see um, new faces and returning faces alike. Um, and so, um, like we'll talk about throughout our presentation today, we have quite literally more volunteer projects than we've ever had before this year. And so we are thrilled to have you here for orientation. We'll talk about exactly how you can get involved in, in our priority projects for the year. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out or um, raise your hand or unmute yourself or type in questions in the chat at any time. So the quick agenda for today is that we'll be talking a little bit about the history of the organization, kind of a history by the numbers um, of the Regional Land Conservancy. Um, Kate will give a campaign for generations update. This will be closer to the end. Um, we'll go through our brand new volunteer handbook and exactly um, what types of things are included in that and what you need to do with it. <laughs> um, an overview of our projects for the year and throughout the presentation today when we're talking about different volunteer projects, I'll be sharing our COVID protocols and procedures that we have in place to keep everybody safe. Um, we are following uh, state, federal, CDC and county guidelines and all of our rules for you know volunteer involvement are consistent with what we're doing. Um, as staff, we have been um, very safe, I'd say very vigilant. Um, all of us staff members have been working from home. Welcome to my kitchen <laughs> for over a year now, um, but we're keeping our finger on the pulse and, and we'll provide updates as, as they come. So our mission at the Conservancy is to protect natural, scenic and farmlands and advance stewardship now and for future generations. Uh, we are a five county nonprofit land trust. We work in Antrim, Benzie, Grand Travers, Kalkaska, and Manistee counties. Um, and what I tell people is in a nutshell, we protect land. Uh, this is our 30th year anniversary as well. Um, to date, we have protected 44,000 acres of land throughout these five counties. Within those 44,000 acres, we have protected 140 miles of shoreline along rivers, lakes, and streams. Um, you can break these numbers down a different, a uh, couple of different ways, but um, ballpark, we have 37 nature preserves and 28 natural areas. And what we mean when we say nature preserve, we mean a property that was protected by and directly owned and directly managed by the Regional Land Conservancy. So this is places like Arcadia Dunes, Greenpoint Dunes, um, many, many nature preserves. Um, when we say natural area, we're talking about a property that we've usually helped to protect, but is now owned by uh, another entity, a local unit of government, maybe a township or a county. Uh, we often play this uh, role of being kind of an assistant to our partners in, um, in government in protecting properties and natural areas that are priorities for them. So, um, the Timbers Recreation Area is a great example of, of one of these properties, the Pelizari Natural Area on Old Mission Peninsula, um, Railroad Point Natural Area in Beulah, which is owned by the county, I believe. So often the Conservancy is doing the fundraising, grant acquisitions, um, and management planning, and then also we're often helping and working with these entities on the long-term maintenance of these properties. Uh, this number is a little bit out of date, but I saw it and it was staggering to me, so I left it in here. But um, to date, we have raised $205 million um, towards our goal um, in private and public funding for our mission. Any questions about the really quick history by the numbers or the way in which the Conservancy uh, does its work? Well, I'd like to hear from folks uh, either in the chat or uh, also feel free to unmute yourself, but um, I would love to hear why this mission, our shared mission is important to you in your life.
Um, for me, um, since returning to Michigan, oh, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Um, since returning to Michigan in 2002 and settling in uh, Elk Rapids, um, I've seen orchard after orchard go away to be replaced by housing, uh, Greek Orthodox Church, uh, no offense to Greek or Orthodox uh, members. Um, and I saw the same thing happen in Colorado to a more, much more alarming degree. Just huge swaths of, of open space, wild space, forested space, just being snapped up and developed. And um, it's, it's very discouraging. And so I want to help preserve the last few spaces that we have. Good. Thank you. Uh, this is a good one, Kim, trying to start a, a career in environmental work and make the world a better place by preserving nature. Um, Actually, oh, me. Um, okay. My yeah. mom's computer, that makes so it sense. comes up with Kim. So that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is a great um, opportunity. I think I mentioned I started as a volunteer at the Conservancy. Sam Griffin started as an AmeriCorps member volunteer. Um, many folks. That's a great um, opportunity to do so. Kate Pearson wrote in the solace of nature makes me feel relaxed. And Erica said the access to beautiful places for all the protecting land and water. Very good. Yeah, excellent man. Spending I, time outdoors is a salve to my soul. I know that in conjunction with what Rick said, um, I think that uh, for me, it's like places like Greenpoint, um, even some areas of the Mount Baldy Trail, um, you can go out somewhere and hike and maybe not see another human and not hear car noise. And, you know, that is such a rare thing today in, in so many other places. And I feel really blessed that I have that. And, and I want to protect it you know, Yeah. Like, kind of like, in the wild places where I think are encouraged to grow in their own way and not focus on that. And that's important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. I've, I've got a pretty, you know, similar reason my, myself, you know, I had a pretty, a pretty fortunate childhood where I had a big undeveloped piece of property behind my dad's place and they got to run around in the woods and I want that for everybody. It's, it's wonderful. I had the opposite. I grew up down in Detroit area in a suburb and there was some farmland around us, but like, as an adult when I went back to visit my grandma, it was all kind of you know, it's just development everywhere. So I kind of had the opposite. Sure. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, keep them coming in. I love I love reading these things, but I, I like to take a moment to just think about your why and why we're all here today and why we're working together in this shared mission because um, it is a broad-reaching mission, and we're all unique. So I'm thrilled to um, show you the volunteer handbook. Most folks will have received this via email already. If you have not, um, know that I'll be following up um, with all volunteers with one of these recordings and I'll share the volunteer handbook again and some other next steps for you to, to follow. But I wanted to go through a couple of key things here in the handbook. I'm not gonna read it all, but you know, the quick history of the way in which we do work is here, uh, of course, amidst some beautiful photos and some nice photos of people doing good work on the land. Um, our sort of philosophy of volunteer involvement and that we are a land ethic community, right? We, we treat each other with respect and, and um, care and we extend that to the plants and birds and rocks and things, right? Um, we talk about our expectations. Um, what we expect from you, and I believe very strongly in, in these things, what you should be able to expect from us at the Regional Land Conservancy. Um, it's my job uh, that I take very seriously to make sure this is 
mutually beneficial. Um, and so of course there's gonna be you know, incredible outcomes for the conservancy because of your um, work and your involvement, but I want this to be as enriching to you as it is to us. Um, these values of excellence, leadership, inclusiveness, generosity, teamwork, respect, communication, integrity, and proactivity um, are the exact same ones that are in our strategic direction. Um, they're the same values that we hold ourselves to as staff members and board members and our volunteers are very much part of our, our community once again. A note on reporting, and I'll show you exactly where this is on the website, but um, there's a link to our volunteer page here. And so when you do any volunteer activity with us, there will either be a paper sign-in form if you're at a small group work day that'll have our COVID protocols and procedures and a health screen form and all of those things in your name. Um, if there's not that, then you would submit all of your hours onto this form that's right on our website. And again, I'll show you where that is. Um, a quick note that reporting is just so beneficial for us in a number of ways. You know, I use our volunteer hours to track the health of our different programs. I use the hours to track the success of some, you know, different initiatives that we're launching. Um, and we are able to use volunteer hours directly as match for um, public and private funding. So we can attribute a dollar amount to your service, which will enable us to secure more funding, to protect more land um, and do more restoration work on our uh, nature preserves. Um, and then my contact information is there. I'll also share this at the end of the PowerPoint slide, but um, know that you can always reach out to me if you have any questions or if you need to get in contact with anybody else at the Conservancy. The last thing I'll talk about, um, you can see our different volunteer programs. These are also right up on our volunteer webpage. Um, and this button right here, volunteer acknowledgement and agreement. So every year we will be requiring volunteers to um, electronically fill out this uh, volunteer agreement and liability waiver. So it's right on the handbook. And again, I'll send that out via email after, um, after we make it through the third orientation tomorrow. I'll show you what it looks like really quickly. Um, quick note here, you would put your name and email here and, and the form uses that information to autofill a couple places on the form. If you are under 18 years old, you would put your parent or guardian's name um, here and their email address, and then a copy will be sent to them via email for them to sign. Um, if, you've, if you've done any real estate transactions in the past couple of years, this form will look very familiar to you. It's the same kind of tool they use, but um, you agree to use electronic records and signatures right here. And then you can scroll through and read all of the volunteer agreements and waivers, and then you'll get to these places where the document will call them right out to you. You just click the, the sign link. You can select a style. You can draw your own signature if you prefer, but I'm just gonna go with the default. Say adopt and sign, click that. And then the the next ones that you click to sign will just auto fill your name. And then it's telling me, okay, I need to choose if I'm 18 years old or older. So I select the correct thing. And then you can just click this button. And I know that was a lot, but it zooms you right down to the next place you need to, to sign. And so then again, once again, you would just click the sign button, holy cats. And um, it at that point just fills in your name. But I do encourage you to read these um, documents. They you know, expand all of our same staff and board policies to our volunteers. So things like our whistleblower protection policy, our conflict of interest disclosure, our drug-free workplace policy, sexual harassment policies, and things like that so that our volunteers are protected just as staff are. Um, and so that should be pretty streamlined. It's been working well. This is the first year we've done it. So, you know, if you do have any hiccups, don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. 
Any questions about this liability waiver or the handbook at this point? Where can we find links to that document? Yep, I would have sent it um, in my last sort of all email um, or all volunteer email a couple of weeks okay. ago, the same one where I sent um, the sign up call for this orientation. But again, I'll be sending it, Sally, um, here in the next couple of days. So you've got it sort of at the, the top of your inbox. And that's, I'll that's helpful to have it repeated so that we can find it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Uh, no problem. And I'll show you where this will land too. The goal is for our website folks to place a new sort of button on our volunteer page. That'll be volunteer resources. And so it'll be right up on our volunteer webpage as well. With that, I'm going to start talking about um, our projects for the year. Um, we've got a couple of categories we'll go through. So we've got some new nature preserves we're excited about that will be set to open to the public this year. Um, we have small group work days and I'll show you how those work. Um, and then we've got a couple of ongoing roles including preserve stewardship, community science and our Maple Bay garden. And so I'll talk about those. First up that I wanna talk about is our new Embayment Lakes Nature Preserve. We are so excited to um, work on this incredible property and um, get ready to open it to the public later this summer. Uh, in the top right panel, you can see sort of the context map where this property is located. Um, just south of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lake Shore, spans right between Long Lake and Rush Lake. Um, and yeah, what more can I say? We're, we're thrilled. We'll have a couple of work days. I'll show you where these will land mm -hmm. um, for volunteers to come and join us on the property to do a variety of things. Sort of the same things our preserve stewardship staff does. But, you know, when we prepare to open up a property to the public, it's always unique. And so we'll be um, doing some cleanups, installing some signage, preparing any trail corridors for use so that <laughs> Um, we can get the public out um, and enjoying this new place. Hey, John, it's worth mentioning that this is one of the five new nature preserves that are part of the campaign for generation success story. So yep. thanks to everyone who's been involved with that. Thank you, Kate. Yep. The next new property we're set to open this year is the Torch River Ridge Cotanch Family Legacy. So this view is looking at the M. Dot scenic um, sort of turnout or rest stop on M72 between Acme and Kalkaska, looking, what is it? I think it's northwest across Skigamog Lake. And you can see right here, there's a blue line that outlines exactly where this property is with this view, this entire ridge top. Um, we are thrilled to open this property to the public this year and volunteers will be joining us um, regularly on Thursdays, I believe, to um, do similar things as Embayment Lakes, get this property ready for the public, quite a bit of trail building and signage installation. And finally, the Mount Mini property. What a gorgeous uh, photo this is. But um, this property sits on this isthmus between Little and Big Platte Lakes. Um, and same as the others, the, the work days for Mount Mini won't immediately be on the workday calendar that I'll show you in a minute because we don't have a parking lot yet. Um, but once we do, we'll have the opportunity to invite volunteers to join us to do similar things, trail building and signage installation to get this property ready for the public questions about any of those three new nature preserves. I can't, I can't overstate how wildly unprecedented it is for us to be opening three new, absolutely incredible nature preserves in one year. We opened mm. two new last year and that was insane, but um, we've got three new this year. It's yeah, it's wild. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. <laughs> I'll keep, I'll keep going, but um, like I said, feel free to uh, chime in with, with questions throughout. Um, I'm gonna take you to our volunteer webpage right now to show you where some of these resources are for you so that you can return here 
um, and get the information you need. This is our volunteer webpage. You can always get here right in this top navigation bar by clicking volunteer opportunities. Um, the event and shift calendar right here in the middle, I'll click into, and this is where you will see all of our events that we're posting for volunteers only. Um, so I'm gonna click into uh, our upcoming tree planting at the Misty Acres Nature Preserve and Spruce Up. Um, but a quick note, there is one uh, relevant for Liz, you near Elk Rapids, the Maplehurst Natural Area is close mm -hmm. to you. And then there's also a tree planting at the Upper Manistee Headwaters Preserve um, this week as well, or next cool. week. So a couple of key features here that I wanna share. Um, all of our events this year will have this language at the top. This event is for GTRLC volunteers only. Um, by virtue of you being here, you've signed up, you are GTRLC volunteers. This language exists for other folks who may just be perusing our website, wanting to get involved. And as a you know notification that you should be signing up to volunteer with us first, that will enable us to um, send our COVID-19 protocols to them um, and make sure that everybody's on the same page with what's gonna be required. We talked briefly about the projects and the basics that are involved. Again, referring back to the fact that we're following state, federal, CDC, county guidelines for COVID-19 and that we may modify and cancel this event at any time according to those policies. A quick note in here, you know, this what should I bring? Um, I would definitely suggest bringing all of these things and I would we require people to bring their face mask. If you don't have one, we will have some on hand for you to use. Um, often, we, we will always require folks to wear their face mask when we show up because we're gonna be gathering usually around the parking lot to talk about the work we have for the day. But then, you know, our, our work is usually, you know, invasive species removal or trail building where we're swinging tools and we've got to maintain six feet of physical distance anyways for safety. And so often when we get to work, we can take our masks off so that we can breathe a little easier because some of it's hard work. <laughs> um, and then again, to reiterate, just for extra double cautious safety, um, you must have signed up to volunteer with GTLC before participating in this event. So just another reminder. Um, and we are asking folks to pre-register, uh, requiring folks to pre-register for events we have set um, thoughtful capacity maximums for each event according to the amount of space we have to physically distance, the number of tools we have, and sometimes just truly the amount of work we have available for this particular task. So once they're full, they're full, but um, we have lots of opportunities throughout the season. Um, we are asking folks, if at all possible, to register two days prior to each event to allow us that time to plan and, and get the appropriate amount of tools in place. Um, and our system is fancy, but not that fancy. So if you need to cancel, you just let me know by email. That's all it works. That's how it works. Any questions about sort of the nuts and bolts of how the work days are run? Um. I do have uh, one question. It's not necessarily about how the work days are run. It's yeah. for these uh, things on the calendar. Are there like locate? Do they give you locations mm. like specifically addresses? Perfect um, question because <laughs> I forgot to mention that. So um, you'll notice here. Usually we would have a directions um, link on there, and I'll show you how it looks on. So here, starting in May, we've got our weekly recurring trail building work days. So. For the Northeast region, what we say is that our meeting place will vary week by week, which will probably be true even for the places that are on one particular nature preserve. So for a couple of reasons, we will be sending the specific meeting location to registered participants um, at least the day before the event, which is another reason we're asking for folks to pre-register two days before. Um, Again, it enables us to sort of move around as necessary because even if we're building trails, say at the Lower Woodcock Lake Nature Preserve, we may be meeting at the parking lot one day and we may be meeting at you know the southern end of the property the next based on where our trail building is happening. And it's another sort of safety precaution to make sure that folks aren't just kind of showing up um, without masks and without understanding what our safety protocols and procedures are. 
Um, are there specific addresses though that are? So that's an interesting question. It is remarkably difficult sometimes to secure a physical address for a place without a house. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll send um, a Google map link to registered participants and that'll take you right to like the latitude and longitude coordinates of where the meeting place will be. Okay, that is makes sense. Is there like a specific um, uh, map that shows what where the locations are within their region because we're not familiar with their region. Oh yeah. yeah. I can see. Let's see. We've got just a little background noise, um, but I will show you. We know where Arcadia is. Mm -hmm. We've been there several times, but um, we're from uh, just uh, south of Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be traveling every time we come up or mm -hmm. he comes up, he'll be traveling and I might be coming with him occasionally. So um, just kind of to get a bird's eye view of where all these places are. Um, you know, for him signing up or, you know, the how long it's going to take to drive and everything. I'm just curious if you have something like that. Yeah, we don't have um, sort of a map of the property specific to where the um, work days are, but I can show you really quickly here um, because I wanted to go through the map anyways. So you guys are asking the exact right questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, okay. no, um, it's perfect. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards too, to, to kind of find the best, the best specific spots for you. Um, but I wanted to share the map to talk about the regions anyways in regarding preserve stewardship. So this is a simple Google map with little pin locations of all of our nature preserves. Um, we are in the Southwest region orientation here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we serve five counties here at the Regional Land Conservancy. And we recognize that um, not everybody who lives maybe down in Cadillac or in the Arcadia area necessarily wants to travel two hours all the way up here to the St. Clair Lake, Six Mile Lake Nature Preserve um, for a work day up there. Some folks do, and then they participate in multiple groups. But I'll talk about the Southwest region here. And so you can see, um, this doesn't show the county lines, but it's essentially Benzie and Manistee County out this way. And I'll show you on the workday calendar, you can see we will have weekly trail building and maintenance work days at the Arcadia Dunes Nature Preserve, which would be one that's closer to you. Um, Paula Driesen, who's on the line, will be leading uh, weekly invasive species removal work days. Um, that'll be a tremendous help to have volunteers um, participating in those. The Misty Acres tree planting, so Misty Acres is right here on the map. And so you can feel free to use this to sort of pan and zoom around a couple of particular places. But Arcadia Dunes will have weekly recurring work days. We'll have a few at Misty Acres Nature Preserve. And then quick note for this particular region, um, Lower Woodcock Lake, we're doing weekly trail building work days on Wednesdays. It's close to the Southwest region, but it's technically within the central region. Um, if you look at the map, we're, we're looking at a number of things, but there's sort of a large divide between, you know, Lake Ann and Beulah where our nature preserves pick up. So that's just where we decided to split the hair. But we welcome folks to participate in, in all events throughout all regions and to submit preserve stewardship reports at any property they go hiking on. Um, the regional email groups are really just that, an, an email group and a way to provide updates and relevant information to you, you know, for properties that are kind of in your neck of the woods. Hey, John. Yeah. I'm just noticing now that the, some of the newer preserves aren't necessarily on that map yet. That's so. true. Lower Woodcock Lake is and Upper Manistee is, but um, since Mount Mini and Embayment Lakes and Torch River Ridge are not yet open to the public, it's not here. And so, um, again, if you choose to sign up for one of those work days, we'll be communicating those needs via email and we'll send a link where they are. But just so you know, here is where Embayment Lakes is, right by Nan. And then um, up over here in between Little and, and Platte Lake is where Mount Mini is in general. Those will be a lot of fun.
And then over here, just, uh, just for your um, information, um, the central region is essentially Grand Traverse County. We've split the hair here so that Maple Bay and, and Yuba and Winter Green Woods are included in the Northeast region um, up by you, Liz, so that um, we recognize many of our volunteers for these properties here, although they're technically in Grand Traverse County, most of our volunteers are coming from Elk Rapids anyways. And so that's why we drew the line, split the hair here. I'm gonna pan back to our volunteer page, show you a couple things. Um, this link right here, submit a report and hours featuring Kyle, although you can only see half of her face, she's on the line. Um, this is where you'll go to submit any hours if you're not filling out a physical paper form during a small group work day. So if you're out um, doing a preserve stewardship visit or doing some work on your own, you would submit your hours via this form. And they go into a spreadsheet like Paula mentioned and we monitor these responses. A couple of categories here should be pretty straightforward to follow. That's not what I want. And the last thing I want to talk about on this particular page is that you can always click into our individual volunteer programs to learn a little bit more about how they work and what's involved. Um, it's kind of a pseudo job description. Um, and one new thing this spring, I'm so thrilled to announce, um, we have a couple of training videos. Paula did a fantastic training video um, walking you through a preserve stewardship visit. And so I would encourage everybody to watch this. Um, and similarly, we have training videos on the trail building and maintenance page. So, you know, I've done a little bit of trail building work at the Conservancy and there's more to it than um, I would have initially anticipated. <laughs> and so it is, it's really helpful to watch these training videos that are on the bottom of the page to see what goes into it and then um, of course, we provide sort of on the job training through our workday leaders on, on every uh, weekly workday event. Tell me again how you got to that page, yeah. how we get to that page. So this page right here is our volunteer page right on our website. So again, okay. the sort of only option oh, on the well, volunteer okay. drop down. And then it's right on the main page, the different sort of cards for, for each program. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you'll see, quick note, um, hike leadership and event volunteers are on hold right now as we are not hosting public hikes or events, but the information is still up. We still want to know if you're interested in helping in those types of things because we'll make a note of it and reach out when we're having those things. John, I have a question. Yeah. Are there physical requirements um, listed in the various descriptions? We list... Um, Okay, so qualifications, I mean, it's pretty lightweight. I'll talk a little bit more about this. Ability to perform strenuous labor for two hours at a time. What does strenuous mean? It's a little bit nebulous. And then also um, in the, in the workday descriptions, we describe mm -hmm. the work a little bit and say that, um, you know, we'll be hiking maybe up to four miles as part of this workday and swinging some tools. That said, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about anything, because often, even when we're trail building, it can be really very hard, <laughs> even for people who do this all the time. But um, some of the first steps of trail building is simply, you know, brushing the sticks away from the trail corridor, trimming back some of the branches and raking some leaves to prepare the bed. So often, we always try to have, um, a variety of tasks that are suitable for folks of all abilities. Not always, so it's good to reach out and ask, but we do work to have a, a variety of, of things available. And reach out to you then? Reach out to me. Um, you know, if you get familiar with who your, your project leader is, um, as I know, like Jake, who's on the line, will be regularly um, present at the Lower Woodcock Lake Trail Work Days. But um, yes, I would say reach out to me um, and I can route your questions the correct place. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. But another thing, everybody, that I think has been really helpful and we talked about at one of our uh, last volunteer planning um, sessions was just to, to reach out if you're new 
and you're trying to learn, you know, reach out to somebody that's that's present at the workday and has done the work before and just kind of work along with them the first few times to really get an idea of um, and, and start to feel more comfortable with um, with the standards that we have for, for trail building or, you know, identifying invasive species, that sort of thing. So I think it's really helpful to, to kind of tag along to somebody that's been doing it uh, for a while. That's a good point, Jake. And that's kind of a new thing we'll do this year um, when we're starting the work days, like we did this morning, we'll ask folks if they're, if they're new to trail building or if they've been doing it for a while, and then that'll be easier to sort of match you up with, with somebody who's experienced. John, can you talk a little bit about preserve steward uh, responsibilities and how many for each, you know, how do you get coordinated to be a preserve steward? Yep, that's a perfect question. We should just go right into that. So um, I'll go back to our map. Um, so preserve stewardship, the long and short of it is that, well, you can see the dots on the map and the, the incredible volume of projects we have. And so now we completely rely on volunteers to be our eyes on the ground on our nature preserves. And so at its, at its core, preserve stewardship is um, volunteers go hiking on, on any of our nature preserves and submit a report via that, that form I, I showed you a little bit earlier on the condition of the, the signs, the parking area, the <coughs> trail corridor, so on and so forth. Um, Paula's video takes you right through everything that you should be looking for and submitting in your report. Um, so if you like to go hiking and um, you don't mind taking two minutes to, to tell us how it was, um, even if you hike somewhere and say everything was beautiful, like Paula mentioned, she is watching the spreadsheet um, of responses and she'll check off. So say, Richard, you go hiking at Greenpoint. She'll check it off the list and say, okay, Richard reported Greenpoint's all clear. We don't need to worry about it until next week. Um, and so that it's, that's its core level is hiking and submitting a report, letting us know how it was. Often volunteers will choose to um, stick some hand pruners or a folding saw in their back pocket. And then while they hike, we'll trim back the raspberries and other things that end up growing into the trail corridor throughout the summer season. That is um, up to you individually if you wanna do that or if you just wanna submit a report. And finally, Paula will share um, a spreadsheet. Maybe she knows what's left, but she keeps a, a table of people that are signed up to do a more, um, a more thorough spruce up, so to speak, of the parking areas and the trail corridors of each nature preserve about once a month. So our volunteers often keep up with, you know, the summer growth of things um, throughout the season, but we found it very valuable once a month to go through as a concerted effort and really, you know, brush the trail corridor back to our, our standards. Right, thanks very much. Yeah. It's, um, it's a little strange sometimes because it feels like you're just, you know, hiking and submitting a report and, and is that really volunteer hours? But it is incredibly uh, helpful for us. We have, um, like I said, 37 nature preserves. It translates into a little over 10,000 acres of land that we directly manage as the conservancy. And we've built and helped to build over a hundred miles of trail in our five county service area. And Jake, I know as much as we would love to just go hiking and maintaining the trails all day, we just don't get to as staff. So we do rely on volunteers. Any questions about um, preserve stewardship? Um, when you sign up for stewardship, is it like a event by event basis or is it for like the entire season? Good question. Preserve stewardship, we folks often sign up for the entire season um, and it's done on your schedule. So truthfully, anytime you go hiking anywhere and submit a report, um, that's extremely valuable for us. And then, like I said, often there's the ability if you wanted to sign up, say for a section of Arcadia Dunes or something like that, then you would sign up to take on the maintenance of that particular parking lot or trail corridor for the season. 
How long is the season exactly? Oh, good, good question. The season, sorry. <laughs> we use these, these insidery terms. I would say the season is, is just starting now. Um, and then we'll run through about, you know, early November. Um, things, things will slow down October, November. Um, you know, the busy season is really the summer months, May, June, July, August. Um, and then we do a little bit of work October and then we do the best we can to stay out of the woods come rifle season, November 15th. <laughs> I, I would say it is important to note if you are doing work on your own the 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 actual you know letting us know that you've done some work is really important for for a number of reasons but uh one is that you know we might be planning a volunteer day or something around that uh clearing a trail corridor or whatnot so just knowing that something's been done is, is very helpful for um the the volunteer community Very good. I'm gonna move into community science. I'm really excited for our, our new effort in community science this year, but um, if you've got more questions, as always, please keep them coming my way. Um, okay, oh, I can't see my tabs because my Zoom video is in my way. Here we go, okay. So this is our iNaturalist page um, at the Regional Land Conservancy. And um, we are thrilled to be uh, launching a new effort in community science. So the Conservancy has, has relied on community science and observations from, from hobbyists throughout our, our uh, existence as an organization. Uh, one of the best example is, is the protection of the uh, dry hill grassland right by Sylvia. Um, it was not on our radar, so to speak, to protect those 450 acres of nesting migratory bird habitat until our volunteers and our partners at the Audubon clubs noted that um, grasshopper sparrows were using these old fallow fields. And because of that observation made by truly volunteers, it elevated the status of that property and the importance of its protection. And so now we have over 450 acres of, of nesting migratory bird habitat um, because of this new knowledge. Um, and we've been the beneficiary of this kind of, you know, of hobbyists and everybody just um, spending their time on our nature preserves and submitting their observations. And so we're, we're making a big effort um, to expand public use and public engagement with science through some of these platforms. Um, one of the big ones is iNaturalist. Um, we'll have some training available uh, coming shortly, and um, iNaturalist has been around a while. There's lots of um, useful videos and help documents available on how to use the platform, but essentially it's an app on your phone, and um, it's designed for experts and beginners alike. So anytime you make an observation on a conservancy nature preserve and you attach a photo, which is sort of the standard operation, um, that observation gets logged into our project. And you can see we're just getting started here, but throughout history, here are already the observations that have been be that are being made on our nature preserves. Um, I can click into you know Arcadia Dunes and show some of the recent observations so you can get an idea of what folks are seeing um, in recent history. Um, it's really, it's, it's a really cool platform. So you take a photo, if, if you're not um, an expert, you submit the photo and then other folks sort of chime in and they, they tell you if they think you're right or you're wrong or if, if they offer a, a different suggestion for what it might be. It's a nice fun way to um, build your plant and animal identification skills. And folks are not um, bashful to let you know if they think you're wrong. They'll <laughs> But this is a really powerful tool for us to understand um, what's out there on our nature preserves and to give us a live shot of, um, of what species and, and the um, wildlife and the flora and fauna that are using our nature preserves that go directly into helping us manage these places better. So the long and short of it is if you start using iNaturalist, there's more training to come on our nature preserves. That data flows directly into these projects per nature preserve and that information goes directly into helping us manage these places according to what uh, what kind of critters and, and wildflowers are out there. 
Similarly, um, eBird is a really powerful tool for um, birders to catalog bird observations. Um, and so very soon, almost all of our nature preserves are already listed as what's called hotspots. Um, I just went to eBird.org and clicked on their hotspots link. Um, so if you are interested in birding on our nature preserves, you can see the incredible amount of hotspots that there are throughout Michigan. And very soon, all of our nature preserves will be a hotspot. And so anytime you make an observation on that hotspot, the same thing, we get to see that observation. We get the benefit of knowing exactly which bird species are utilizing our nature preserves. Um, you know, the poster child for us is the Arcadia Marsh. We know because of eBirders and volunteers that 252 species of birds have been found at the Arcadia Marsh, which is an incredible number. Um, truly one of the premier spots to, for birding observations in the state of Michigan, certainly in our neck of the woods. Um, and we know all of this because of the volunteers and the hobbyists that use eBird and submit their observations to the hotspot for the Arcadia Marsh. Let's see, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. You can see here, we've got a few folks um, looking at a tray of some wet stuff. So we did an all aquatic citizen science day. Um, at the Upper Manistee Headwaters Preserve. So we are also gonna be involved with the Watershed Center's um, biotic index mapping. Um, so we'll be monitoring streams for their uh, water quality to show the impact of our work on improving water quality. Um, and we've got a few other things coming down the pipeline, including um, beach cleanups. So we are helping the Watershed Center and other folks monitor the amount of beach litter and the type of beach litter. And so that's gonna be an ongoing effort anytime you go walking the beaches um, and you're picking up litter, there's a nice little app that you can use to log all of your observations. So more details on both of those programs to come. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our specific priorities for community science, um, please let me know either in the chat or just send me an email afterwards. And what I'm doing right now is collecting sort of an email list of folks and we'll share what our upcoming priorities and needs are for community science. Any questions about those programs or projects? All right. Moving right along, we have some remote office opportunities as well. We are not in the office as you can see. Um, but we do have some standard um, data entry that is so important, you know, for data integrity purposes and getting the work done and a very uh, specific need coming right up. Um, we have what we would usually call gratitude gatherings. And so we're getting ready to send our spring appeal for support and inevitably donations will roll in thankfully to the conservancy and we, um, bring volunteers into the fold, so to speak, to help us share our appreciation for those donations by handwriting thank you notes. As someone who's done this quite a lot myself, um, I, I, love, I love doing it for personal reasons. I find taking 20 to 30 minutes out of my day to um, focus on gratitude and share my appreciation for um, other folks choosing to support this work. Um, I find that is really um, beneficial for my mental health and wellness and well-being. Um, and it's just a really nice way to extend the conservancy's value of, of gratitude to all of our supporters. Um, Kate, you know, has seen many of the impacts of this work, but we hear from so many folks um, after we send these notes that this is the first time they've received a handwritten note from a nonprofit that they've chosen to support and that it's um, so impactful on, on their decisions and, and they just appreciate, they appreciate the appreciation. And so if you're interested in spending some time and sharing gratitude for people who choose to support this work, uh, we can use your help here as well.
the last ongoing project I'll talk about that you won't find really elsewhere on the website is the volunteer garden at Maple Bay. So we have 11 acres right around this incredible natural area um, that you can see the uh, food pantry donation garden in the background there. We have um, a small group of volunteers that, that work the field, so to speak. The Conservancy provides the land, the water, the compost. Uh, the volunteers provide their labor and the plants themselves. And we work together to showcase sustainable agriculture practices um, to young folks who may not even understand where their food comes from, to folks who want to uh, maybe begin a career in farming or start their own garden plot in their backyard. And we donate at least 75% of what's grown in the garden to local food pantries. We've partnered with um, uh, Food Rescue of Northwest Michigan. Uh, they do pickups weekly to give this fresh, um, organically grown produce to local food pantries. And um, it's just a really great community of folks working and learning together to grow, to grow produce here in Northern Michigan. Um, last year, we donated 540 pounds to local pantries. And despite only requiring at the time, 50% of your food to be donated, we ended up, the volunteers just decided to donate 90 to 95% of what they grew to, to local food pantries. So it's a great cause, um, a great way that the Conservancy's mission can be used to support the, the community itself. So that is, uh, that is it. Those are our priorities for the year. Once again, um, all of the work that you do enables, enables us to, to be successful in our mission. We could not do this without your support. Uh, it's a tremendous task, a tremendous responsibility, and we are so grateful.